This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is brought to you by Canna Planners. Canna Planners is on a mission to normalize the emerging cannabis industry through beautiful design and professional web and marketing solutions. Whether you're looking to create a new cannabis brand, improve your packaging design, or get your company online, Canna Planners has the perfect solution. Your website is the window into your cannabis company. Make sure that you look awesome, that your messaging is on point, and that traffic converts to customers through SEO. From CBD companies to dispensaries and everything in between, Canna Planners has you covered. Visit them online today at cannaplanners.com for a free web demo. That's cannaplanners.com. Hey there, I'm your host, TG Brandfault, and thank you for listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Uh, today is kind of a special show. Uh, I'm joined by the founders of Gondrepreneur, uh, the Abbott brothers, Noel Abbott, who's the CEO, and Graham Abbott, who's the chief editor. Um, before, you know, we sort of before they introduce themselves and get into their background, uh, I just want to tell a little story. You know, uh, I met these guys about six years ago, never actually met them in person, uh, through a Craigslist ad. Uh, I had just uh, covered um, the passage of medical cannabis in New York uh, for Reuters, and, you know, I was doing a lot of freelancing, and uh, they were looking for a brief writer. And, you know, here we are six years later. We've never really, you know, discussed in public uh, sort of our relationship and, and how Gondrepreneur works. So Noel, Graham, how you guys doing? Uh, doing great. Uh, this is Graham here. Um, yeah, Noel here. Yeah. Great. Doing doing well. Thanks for having us, TG. It's uh, been a long time coming. Yeah. So so why don't you guys just sort of tell everyone, you know, uh, the stuff that, that I know a lot of but don't know everything uh, about you, about your background. How would you guys uh, end up in the cannabis space and, and what's it like uh, doing this, you know, as brothers? Totally. Um, well, I guess uh, I'll, I'll jump in first. This is Noel. Um, I guess... Uh, to provide background on, on you know how we wound up here specifically with with Gondrepreneur and sticking with it for so long, um, it would make sense to start with when we first had the idea of uh, starting a, a project together, um, you know of any kind, and that was uh, it was about eight years ago I think um, when Graham and I were on the uh, Camino de Santiago, which is a, a trek in Spain. Um, and this was right after Graham had graduated from college. Yeah. Um, and uh, Camino de Santiago is a is a pilgrimage. I think it's it's got Catholic background, and it's um, it's about five hundred miles total from start to finish. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a lot of walking. I didn't do the whole thing. Um, I met up with uh, Graham at about the halfway point, I think. Uh, Graham had just graduated college and I was, I still had a full-time job at the time working for a uh, software um, company. And um, I remember when I met up uh, with them at the, with Graham and the group that he was with, um, at the halfway point, I walked into the town and they were sitting at this table uh, having, um, you know, having lunch at a, uh, at a terrace restaurant and uh, there was this woman at the table who was a venture capitalist, an angel investor, and uh, she had already been talking with Graham about, and, and his friend uh, who was on the trek with him, about uh, the idea of uh, pitching her a company during the course of that journey. And Graham, do you want to, I, I don't really know the background of that. Oh, um, well, yeah, she was just, I think she was looking for uh yeah, youngsters to invest in and grow her fortune. And uh, she was really <laughs> pushing for us to come up with that next big idea that that uh, she could invest in. And, and then, um, so yeah, we kind of tossed some things around. And uh, I think, I believe you were the one who actually talked to her first about the canvas industry and all that. Um, right, yeah. So um, that was after the trek had completed. I think uh, yeah. it was- she it did. Was couple months later, we, we had originally mentioned the idea. We didn't really have a fleshed out um, 
proposal for her, but we had mentioned the idea of some kind of a um, an app that would connect uh, community gardens and organic farms and like locally produce uh, food with people nearby. Um, and uh, she didn't really see how that was going to be very profitable. So we kind of left it at that. It was sort of a, a, a dead, uh, a dead chain of emails for a while. Then when um, Washington and Colorado first had their votes to, uh, to create the uh, adult use industries, um, I reached back out to her with a, with a proposal for some, uh, some ideas for a cannabis focused uh, media project. And she just flat out rejected me and was almost in, in fact offended that uh, I would have thought of her for that. Um, but that really was what got us thinking about uh, just the possibility of creating a project that we could use to sustain ourselves and sort of determine our own career trajectories. Um, so I'll credit her with the uh, with planting that seed in our brains because neither one of us really had, um, you know, thought I, about that yeah. as a as a potential um, direction for a project. And what about mm -hmm. you? What about you, Graham? Like, what was your, your you know, uh, Noel was doing you know software stuff. What were you doing prior to <laughs> graduating college and and you know very shortly thereafter it appears ending up. Mm -hmm. starting entrepreneur um yeah i well so i in college i studied uh communications and then after graduating um left and went on that trip it, it kind of for me it started as just that pilgrimage um just kind of an experience and then uh i ended up staying in europe and then uh when my visas had run out there we went over to southeast asia and I ended up on a long year tour around the world and then came back and was looking for something to do. And I, that very first summer I came back, I was canvassing for a little bit. That kind of got me into the political sphere. Um, but then it, it uh, I ended up, it was right when I like had quit that job was when Noel started talking to me uh, about the idea of, of writing on a semi-regular basis about this budding industry. Um, and, uh, we were, we were certainly really excited about, uh, about the industry, about, about legalization in general. And, and, you know, we'd been supporters of the movement since I, I can't speak for Noel, but for me, it was in college was where I, um, came around to cannabis and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was in high school. I was, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a narc, but I was. I was pure, you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so why why the media space? I mean, I mean, you know, you have this background in, in sort of software and, and you know communication. I mean, I obviously ended up in in the cannabis media space, but it didn't you know found a media company. And so, so first of all, why did you guys decide you know that the, the news and, and sort of media side of it, and then sort of describe you know going from this little blog. Um, you know, to be able to, hi to to hiring writers and, you know, becoming, you know, sort of a mainstream source. Totally. Um, so at the time that I had first reached out to Graham about starting um, a project, we had a few different ideas that we were throwing around. There was, uh, um, you know, an idea to offer marketing services and web development services because that was really my career focus at the time um, to retailers and manufacturers as they started opening up. And um, we did pursue that a bit. And um, I still am a partner in a small creative agency um, that I started with some friends uh, a, a few years prior to that, um, that never really became our full time focus, but it's, it's been something that has continued on. Um, and so, you know, that was, that was one angle and the blog concept was really just to establish presence at the beginning to uh, to have a place where we could publish things on a regular basis um, and uh, you know it, it seemed obvious that people were going to be interested in keeping tabs on the industry as it developed um, granted there were already a lot of 
cannabis oriented publications out there, um, but not very many of them focused specifically on the business side of the industry or the B2B angle. Um, and so that was our focus from the beginning was to talk about the entrepreneurs and the businesses that were starting up. And over time, I think that that became our main focus just because it is a you know, cannabis is a very volatile industry. There's stories all the time about companies that came at the industry with a bunch of money and then wound up, you know, not hitting their their benchmarks that they expected to hit and then wa- winding up getting acquired or, you know, gutted in some fashion. Um, and uh, with a media company, um, it's it the, the business model works as long as there's an audience. So the the volatility in terms of the changing regulations and competition and all of that, um, it doesn't really affect us in the same way that it affects uh, operators who are touching the plant. Um, so, you know, I knew f- for for our sake, also, uh, both of us had writing backgrounds um, from from our, you know, from our education and uh, just, just hobbies. So, um I think that that's that's why it really became our main focus, and that's ultimately why it wound up becoming the more successful idea of the the several that we had started out with. Um, and then over time, um, you know, we, we never really had any any moment of uh, exponential growth. It's always just been steady, uh, hard work, and. Um, Luckily, we've had the opportunity to partner with really talented people and, and to get really, um, really competent individuals on our team. And I, I really credit that as the, uh, the most uh, contributive factor in, um, in where we're at today. And, and Graham, what was the learning curve like for you? You know, you had, you had gone through a communications program, but you know, you you, had, you said that you know you didn't really get into uh, cannabis until college, and then and then I mean, you ended up uh, you know being the the chief editor. Um, you know, when when I started with you guys, you know, it was on a much smaller scale than than it's become. But you know, you were my point person for a long time, and it never really seemed to me that, you know, you were that new to this. It's almost a surprise <laughs> to me that, that you, you got, you know, sort of acquainted with cannabis, you know, later than a lot of people uh, who would sort of end up in your role. So, so what was the learning curve like for you? Um, well, it was steep, um, but it was also, honestly, it was a lot of fun at first. Um, I really, I, I, I knew like my weaknesses going into it and, uh, and just kind of devoured the news cycle for, uh, I mean, I don't know, never really stopped. But I, I think I, I mean, cause it's, it's true. I didn't like study journalism specifically uh, in school. And so I kind of had to, um, yeah, embed myself into there and, and really try and uh, learn as much as I could. Um, while uh, while participating in the industry kind of so um since since the launch I've, I've, uh, yeah you know things have gone well for the most part there were some hiccups and but um i'm i'm glad to hear that that you uh were <laughs> were unaware of my relative rookiness from the beginning um, no, I mean, it sort of speaks to, I mean, both of you guys, I mean, as, as leaders of this organization, I mean, neither of you have ever sort of, uh, you know, there's never been this, this sort of, I don't know, thirst for power or sort of arrogance that comes with the role. I mean, you know, Noel, you, you, when, when I started, I, I think you were technically the CFO, um, you know, and I think I was a CTO. CTO, that's exactly yeah, yeah. what it was yep. way back then. So, um, so, so tell me guys about, you know, sort of the experience building a brand, totally. uh, you know, from scratch, um, which you both sort of have to have that background in, um, and, and, and then, and then tell me about, you know, the doing it again with oregano and, and the, the sort of end game with oregano. You talk about that a little bit too. Sure. Um, well, yeah, before we get to oregano, I'll answer the question about, you know, how how did we um, how did we ultimately get to where we are? You know, in terms of going from the relative obscurity to uh, 
to being more of a of a brand and an established organization and I think that that really, you know, that transition started uh, when we first uh, got connected with Andrew Rosner, who is the other official co-founder and the primary investor behind Gondrepreneur. And he, you know, at the beginning, you said you, you found us through a Craigslist ad. Um, Andrew also found us through the internet, and I had never met him when we first spoke. And uh, we didn't actually meet in person until well after we had been uh, partnered with him on Gondrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I think it was like over a year later. Um, but uh, basically, that's right. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> at the High Times Cannabis Cup on April 20th. The the, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the cr still the craziest thing I've ever done uh, that, that this mm -hmm. a job has afforded me was the Michigan Cannabis Cup. I mean, <laughs> it, it's a dream come true, right? They're, they're wild places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't been uh, recently, but the one that we attended was definitely like that was the first time I'd ever been to any cannabis event, and it was also the uh, the very first after the opening of the adult use markets in Colorado, and I was still full time employed um, as the marketing director for a software company at the time, so I had to uh, you know tell them a lie and say that I was going camping for the weekend uh, with my brother. Really, we were going to meet the investor behind our uh, cannabis industry startup Hilarious. that ultimately I wound up leaving them for. Um, and uh, you know, it it, um, it was it was definitely uh, an eye opening experience. And when we did meet Andrew, it was a it was an awesome. You know, uh, we'll, we actually didn't get to hang out with him for very long because he wound up <laughs> uh, babysitting the cast of Super Troopers who got <laughs> too high on dabs at the yeah. event. Um, so we only got to hang out with Andrew for like an hour, but um, I could just tell that, you know, he was as excited about the project as we were. Um, wow. It seemed like, you know, the, the focus was just on the uh, – incredible opportunity of being a part of history and being a part of uh, this massive change in society um, that, you know, is going to be slow, but um, is hopefully a sign that, uh, that there's, you know, going to eventually be a world where cannabis is not demonized and criminalized and people don't have to uh, be locked up in prison for doing something that, uh, you know, doesn't harm anybody. And, uh, you know, now there's still people locked up in prison um, for nonviolent cannabis offenses. Um, and uh, that, you know, kind of brings us to the, uh, the project oregano.com, which we had uh, started planning last year. Um, and to get into that, basically, the context, um, I guess I didn't fully explain uh, Andrew and his role. Um, yeah. w when we first partnered with Andrew, um, the deal was he owned gondrepreneur.com and we were currently operating on a different domain name. It was something like the gondrepreneur.us. And he had the uh, same idea for a brand and had reserved this domain much earlier. He reached out to us and uh, he liked what we were doing and wanted to partner with us and have us use his domain. He would fund the company and we would all be partners. So, Fast forward five years, five and a half years um, to 2019 when, you know, we're, we're pretty well established. Um, Graham and I had talked about the idea of doing cannabis industry satire. Just a, We tried a few times too. Yeah, we tried on through Gondrepreneur on, on April Fool's Day and things like they, that. They, people got really upset. Yeah. yeah they don't like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the whole, uh, the fake news you know, because people don't read disclaimers or, you know, take away the obvious uh, conclusions from a headline um, that's, you know, clearly false. If, if they don't get that right away, then they're very upset. Um, so it makes sense to separate satirical content from editorial content. I agree with that 100%. So oregano uh, was an idea that we had. Um, I realized that Andrew also owned oregano.com, the domain name. Um, and um, he is, in fact, one of the most prolific domain name brokers and investors uh, worldwide. And there's this whole uh, industry of aftermarket domain names that Andrew is uh, repeatedly and, you know, continuously um, awarded as one of the, uh, the top people in that industry. Um, 
And he's been around for a long time, so he's been acquiring really valuable domain names for a long time. And uh, I pitched the idea of using oregano as a as a satirical outlet for the cannabis industry, and he he was on board with it immediately. Um, and the reason why I think we felt the need for satire in the cannabis industry was specifically because after being around for so long, we had witnessed so much of what I guess I would only describe as like folly. You know, there's just people with a lot of money coming to the industry, assuming that everything's going to work out fine, assuming that they know the audience that they're trying to reach um, and, uh, you know, just falling flat. And it, it happened over and over and over over the course of the, the past, you know, five or six years. And um, so we, we definitely had, um, you know, I would say some, uh, some apprehension or annoyance about certain things in the industry. And we wanted an outlet for that uh, um, so that uh, we could, you know, hopefully produce something that's going to entertain the people in the industry who have been around for a long time, who've seen all the, all the, you know, the struggles of the industry. And uh, we, we wanted it to be something that wasn't just going to be, you know, purely for entertainment's sake, because you can't really separate um, cannabis from its history and its you know, the context of prohibition and the uh, massive amount of injustice. So we decided to uh, uh, partner with an organization uh, called the Last Prisoner Project. Um, and uh, their mission is to bring um, restorative justice to people who have been affected by the drug war, um, specifically people who are in prison for uh, drug-related offenses. Um, and uh, so the idea was we would launch this... Uh, satirical outlet and at the end of every article it would have a disclaimer along the lines of you, you, this article is a joke but you know what's not a joke is that there's still 40,000 people behind bars for nonviolent cannabis uh, um, infractions um, and um, so since the the death of George Floyd uh, you know this that was about a, what a month ago now 50 50 something days ago I think it is 56 maybe 57 from the time that we're recording this um, you know we as an organization and, and at you it's sort of the direction of, of you guys um, ha, have sort of brightened the spotlight uh, on social justice aspects of prohibition and I mean we've always covered you know the the social equity stuff because you know we, we've always had sort of a very heavy business focus and and you know so so i, I mean ob the the obvious answer there's an obvious answer to this question but but why sort of did ha have you got have you guys decided to you know put a bunch more emphasis uh, on this issue collectively right you know you guys are the 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 steer the ship yeah um and it's caught us some. I mean, I mean, let's let's just be honest, right? Like, like if you read the comments, you know, we we post some of the social justice stuff and and some of the, you know, and and I mean, we get laugh reacts for it. I mean, I mean, seriously. It, that, yeah, that, yeah. So so so, you know, I just want to point that out to to, totally. to the listeners. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so to to fully answer that question, I mean, uh, so. The, the timeline with oregano was we had planned to launch it on April 1st um, because of April Fool's Day and satire. And it was in March that the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic started to really take off. And uh, the Last Prisoner Project, who we were working with, reached out to us and said, hey, we're afraid that if we don't act soon, that the people that we're trying to save and to grant clemency for are going to be trapped in prison as this virus makes its way through the prisons. Um, and so they wanted to get the word out as soon as possible um, because it, it was also an opportunity to put pressure on the government to, uh, to actually get something done. Um, and so we launched Oregano early. It wasn't quite, uh, wasn't quite finished, but we, we have had launched the platform and then you know over the next month or two the the pandemic continued to spread some jurisdictions have uh granted clemency to prisoners but um it's really nowhere near the um the amount that we would need to uh, to actually achieve you know some semblance of restorative justice um but then after the death of george floyd um you know i 
I just sort of had realized that you know, over the past several years, while we have focused on um, social equity in the, the states um, that have opened up adult use markets, um, and, you know, I've always said that, you know, we want to reflect diversity in the people who we profile, that we really weren't putting very much of a conscious effort into, you know, accurately communicating the true depth of how just absurd the injustice is surrounding cannabis prohibition and how cannabis prohibition and the enforcement of it has tied into institutional racism and uh, has really just decimated communities that are over-policed. Um, and um, it, it also wasn't just up to me um, and Graham, I would, I would credit a lot of that uh, shift in direction of our reporting to the women that we have hired. Um, Ellie, who we hired uh, just over a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, when she came on to, uh, to help us with social media, she told me that she wanted to focus on social justice with the uh, accounts that she was choosing to highlight and to, uh, to repost from. And you know, she pointed out that we weren't doing very much of that. And I said, you know what, you're right, let's do it. Um, and then after, um, you know, after the death of George Floyd and all of the protests all over the country, I think a, a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I hope, and I, I've witnessed it, so I wouldn't just say hope, but I, I hope that all white people are thinking about this at least. But as you mentioned, yeah, there are definitely people who think that it's all part of some media manipulated narrative <laughs> and that it's all a conspiracy so, um, so let me play devil's advocate for a second graham do, do you think that you know uh you know we call ourselves a, you know we, we we are a b2b publication um do you think that it runs against the mission of being a business focused publication to put more emphasis on the, the social justice aspects of prohibition oh uh no <laughs> Short answer, no. Um, I I think that uh, being, I mean, as I'm I'm not a cannabis business operator myself, obviously, but I I do, you know, owe my livelihood to the industry. Um, and the bottom line is that any any person or any entity that's benefiting from the cannabis space is uh, implicitly benefiting from the the painful history that cannabis has undergone because the only reason why there's this new exciting industry right now is because it's been tamped down for so long and 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 uh, so many people have been oppressed in the name of making this glorious new industry it's just uh you know there it, it's not enough for current business owners to just be sad for the people who have been locked up for decades. Um, and you can't just say like, yeah, that sucked, but things are better now and, and we're taking our own opportunities. Everything is tied back to that painful history and there needs to be action from members of the industry. Um, and to not act is, uh, is, is yeah, it's, it's morally unacceptable. Yeah, it's a, it, there's an interesting parallel there with uh, the existence of institutional racism as a whole. You mm -hmm. know, um, it's, like a, it's like a conveyor belt that moves in one direction. And uh, if you're not doing anything, then you're still moving with the conveyor belt. You actually, you actually have to, you know, make an effort to work against the current in order to have any effect. Um, and you, there's no such thing as neutrality. You can't just remain, uh, you know apathetic to it um by doing so you're you're implicitly choosing the side of uh, the status quo so it's a, 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 so the, the, we're you know we're talking about you know sort of the changes of uh you know the, the social order in some ways and, and how it relates to sort of what we do um and so i just want to ask you sort of you know briefly the the future of sort of cannabis industry publishing uh especially in the era of COVID. i mean we have worked uh remotely from the jump uh i've worked what in three or four different states uh while working uh, for you guys um you know i, I think graham's done pu some publishing from paris france or at least somewhere yeah yeah Super southern fancy. france um, there for a summer 
you know, so so in the era of, of COVID, what what is this? What do you guys see sort of as the future of the cannabis industry publishing? Um, you know, and just sort of briefly, uh, we can talk about high times and you know how their IPO uh, has. What, you know what that sort of means because it, it's stalled and it hasn't done the numbers that uh, you know they thought it would. In the meantime, they're they're buying a bunch of brands and started touching the plant. Um, to, you know, talk to me about sort of what you guys see the future of of industry publishing at large. You know, especially again seeing what's happened with high times. So, I think the the current state of of cannabis media. Um, is in a kind of a precarious position because so many uh, media companies, especially in the cannabis industry, have focused on the combination of print and events. And both of those are more difficult events, um, much more so um, in the world of the coronavirus. And, you know, I, I think high times, um, you know, whether or not... Um, they were going to have to close down publications, um, you know, just due to the the you know need for revenue um, prior to the spread of the pandemic um, is its own question. But obviously, with with uh, the coronavirus, um, the business model of of hosting big events on a regular basis uh, just becomes really really difficult, and um, there's no clear end in sight at this point. So the companies that have relied on that, I, I think they're they're having a hard time. I think that print specific publications are probably um, overall going to be fine. Um, and you know, even though we have seen numerous cannabis publications get closed down, there are also people who are doing really awesome things and who are setting a great example for the industry as a whole. Um, some, some companies that I would name in that regard are the Northwest Leaf. Um, they've been expanding and they actually hired a bunch of the High Times writers who got laid off uh, for their newest expansion in the Northeast. Um, there's a magazine called Broccoli Magazine, which is entirely uh, women-led and created. Um, and that's a really awesome, uh, like, artistic focused cannabis magazine um, and I, I really love what they're doing there's other industry publications like marijuana venture um, and you know I have a sense that all of these companies are, are going to be fine just because their audience um, still wants them around um, for us I think that the coronavirus you know because we're a digital first company we've always been a remote company we've only ever created digital offerings we don't we don't host events we don't print uh, magazines um for us the the impact of the coronavirus has really been pretty minimal um i think you know for for niche publications and other industries that might not be the same thing but in the cannabis industry you know, we've seen cannabis be deemed essential in, in pretty much all of the states where it's been legalized. Um, and there's, you know, clearly a high demand for cannabis during this time where people are stuck at home and, uh, you know, they're stressed out. And, um, you know, it's just natural that people are going to, uh, to spend some of that time consuming cannabis. Um, I think it's healthier than if they were uh, drinking. Um, so, you know, in the long run, um, after f where we're at four months, uh, four months later from when we kind of went into lockdown, um, it doesn't really seem like the um, the effect on the economy is is really having the same effect on us. Um, and I think that uh, hopefully, cannabis media will be able to uh, sustain and you know all of these companies that are are producing great content and. Uh, employing people um, will be able to tough it out and, uh, you know, make a resurgence after after there's some uh, return to normalcy. What's your take on that, Graham? Um, yeah, well, I feel like that sums things up <laughs> pretty nicely. Um, do, do, do you think that, do you think that, like, when when the when the virus hit right for, for example you know as as sort of the chief editor you know do, do you think that uh overall the industry uh did well sort of with uh how it covered 
the coronavirus because at, at the onset, right, there was, I mean, I, I'm sure you were too, we, we were getting bombarded with sort of, uh, what do I want to call them, snake oil salesmen. You know, saying mm -hmm. that that you know, oh, the, you know, my cannabis product is is going to save you from uh, the coronavirus. Um, did, do you think that the industry did, uh, the the publishing side of the industry did well in not sort of biting on that uh, those those duplicitous claims of fly by night companies? Um, I I'd, I'd say for the most part, yes. I think uh, publishers have been uh fairly responsible in that i i know there have been um like so obviously there are you know so-called snake oil pushers who are uh and and this was the case before the covid 19 with uh you know certain quote bad players in uh, there was a, the cbd there was industry be specifically we, we had a whole section planned on oregano that was just about, you know, CBD <laughs> infused products like CBD infused shoelaces, CBD infused <laughs> washing machines, you know, like, yeah. And so there's, there's I, been a lot of those. Yeah. And, and I do think that the industry, you know, we have, we're guilty ourselves of, you know, we'll talk about the latest. I, I think we ran an article about CBD infused sportswear at one point. <laughs> and certain, certain things are just so eye-catching, like you you have to, it has, it deserves some mention just for how out there it can be. Well, I, mean, I think it depends on how you cover it, you know, and I, yeah, I think exactly. that's been one of the sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the good things about having, uh, you know, sort of you both at the helm in, in that you, you're steady, you know, we, we've, we, and, and so like, it's not like we cover it and make a big deal about it. We just want people to know like, hey, here's the information, but, but you know, we've never mm -hmm. editorialized too much. Yeah, on occasion. Um, yeah, when, I, when, yeah, when I go gonzo and, and do too many dabs and, in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and in terms of, so for the, there have also been these stories popping up um, about, you know, unverified studies investigating cannabinoids and terpenes and their uh, potential effectiveness against uh, certain symptoms of COVID-19. And, and those, you know, we always have to preface that with this is a non-peer reviewed, this is a pre-published article, um, but it's, it's a, because the situation is evolving so fast, rapidly i think it's still an important conversation or an important and topic of conversation and it's clear i mean it has been clear for a long time that uh uh cannabidiol uh is a, a very effective uh reducer of inflammation and i, I know I, that, you know just from anecdotal evidence everybody that i talk to who use it says that i've personally experienced that and there's medical research that shows that so i don't think it's completely outside the realm of possibility that it's a a viable treatment for alleviating symptoms and you know if it if it's you know if that's possible um and it's being held up by the current state of regulations i think that it deserves more attention well and i'm actually sitting here with uh with the half injured shoulder we'll call it and it's it's covered in cbd and i yeah. i feel great uh yeah you know, and so, so, you know, in the last couple of minutes here, guys, um, tell me, give, give me some advice. What would you tell an entrepreneur uh, about building a brand? Because I think that that's something that you guys have collectively done really, really successfully, um, just from the imagery to sort of uh, the, 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 just, just the, the, you know, the colors and, and the attitude of the brand. So, so what advice would you have for uh, entrepreneurs, you know, specifically when it comes to brand building? Um, sure. Uh, I'll go first real quick yeah, and just totally. say uh, I think uh, consistency and uh, and not um, don't be in a race to do everything and all of it all at once. Um, I think focusing and fine tuning and and just staying consistent to your original idea and uh, add add some elbow grease and. Uh, good direction and and that's uh, probably a better recipe than uh most 
And maybe walk yeah. 500 miles on a pilgrimage before you launch a company? <laughs> I don't know. that. Uh, if, if that's something you're into, I can't highly recommend it. <laughs> well, I, I would definitely credit, um, you know, I, I think that the uh, the success of our, our brand in a um, – you know, in a marketing context, um, I credit a lot of that to uh, my business partner in the creative agency that I had co-founded uh, before Gondrepreneur, uh, Casey Burton, who now is our um, creative director at Gondrepreneur. And he uh, really conceived of and designed the entire uh, visual identity of Gondrepreneur as it currently exists. Uh, prior to that, it was it was kind of a, you know, we, we didn't look... Um, bad, I would say, but we definitely looked a little DIY. It was just stuff that I had, had put together. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, if you have people, um, you know, with different perspectives talking about how things look and um, how they are experienced by a user, if it's a, if it's a website or, you know, whether that's packaging, um, as long as you have uh, people who have knowledge about design and um, um, branding weighing in on that conversation, then you're you're headed in the right direction. I think a lot of uh, startup entrepreneurs uh, wind up thinking of their visual representation and their branding as kind of an afterthought to their idea. And it's something that they want to, um, you know, save money on. And so you can go to Fiverr or you can go to like a logo competition website and just pay a hundred dollars and get like 10 different quote logos. Um, but uh, the visual identity of your organization goes so much further than just the logo. Um, it really all has to tie into one singular philosophy or ideology that carries through everything. And so your, you know, your color scheme, your, your typography, um, everything that exists in the real world, like print and packaging, um, along with everything on the internet should all be consistent. Um, and that doesn't just mean like putting the same logo on everything. So, so having someone, um, whether that's an internal employee who you trust or an agency that you work with separately to help you with that when you're at the point where you can afford to do something like that, I would say is very important. So, you know, before we go, I just want to sort of uh, thank you guys, you know, for uh, the last, you know, six years. It was funny the other day, I was going through my Facebook memories and I actually had mentioned it was uh, February 25th, uh, 2014. Uh, was the first time that I ever wrote anything for you guys, which was oh, super wow. bizarre to wow. see that, like ahead of this, you know, and, and uh, you know, you guys have, have given me a lot of flexibility as a professional. Um, you know, you've always worked with me, uh, you know, as I transitioned to teaching and, and sort of some of the other, uh, some of the other things, um, you know, that, that I've gone through in the last, over the last six years, just sort of professionally, and, um, you know, I, I really appreciate what you guys have done in terms of, you know, offering a, a really sort of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a special sort of website, I think, and, 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 and uh, product that you offer people. And, and, you know, it's definitely a representation of what you guys had in mind, at least from my estimation, six years ago when I met you. So, you know, and, and one day we'll meet in person. A lot of people probably don't know. We've actually never met in person. Uh, I've always stayed on the East Coast uh, and then the Midwest briefly. And so, you know, maybe one day uh, you guys can come kick it in the mountains because I'm not getting on a plane anytime soon. So <laughs> it's up to you. Road trip. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so again, thanks for uh, being uh, on the show. Uh, that was the founders of Gontrepreneur, Noel Abbott. He is the CEO and Graham Abbott, the chief editor. Uh, thank you guys again so much. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, have, thanks for having us, TG. Uh, we, we appreciate you, man. Yeah. Oh, and, and real quick, uh, just also a quick thank you to our uh, audience. We never really get the chance to address them directly but it means a lot that people tune in and and keep tuning in and uh we'll keep it up you can find more episodes of the gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of gontrepreneur.com uh, spotify and in the apple itunes store on the gontrepreneur.com website you'll find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily along with transcripts of this podcast you can also download the gontrepreneur.com app in itunes and google play this episode was engineered by trim media house i've been your host tg brandfault <laughs> <laughs>